we go! Dragon Age 2 is a deeply flawed game. It stripped back all the strategy of its predecessor, completely redesigned the series' aesthetics, reused the same maps constantly, simplified combat encounters considerably, had dull and flat lighting, and lacked a central villain or plot to drive the story forward. And it is by far my favorite Dragon Age game. So let's talk about Dragon Age 2. <laughs> Dragon Age Origins wasn't just a return to form for Bioware, it was their highest selling game to that time. The console version broke into the top 10 highest selling games in America. It made it into the book 1001 Video Games You Must Play Before You Die, winner of over 30 Best of 2009 awards. It was a hell of a feather in Bioware's cap. They would proven to the world that late 90s era CRPGs still had a place in the video game market that PC-centric RPGs could still stand out. It took Bioware seven years and a crew of 180 people to bring us Dragon Age Origins. And after all their success, you knew EA would ask about a sequel. And with how dense and vibrant the world of Thetis was, it would be easy for Bioware to head off in any direction they wanted. The only problem was EA gave the team 14 months to make that sequel. Four. The tight deadline was the result of Bioware Austin's MMO, Star Wars The Old Republic, underperforming, and EA wanting another hit Bioware game in 2011. So the initial plans for a Dragon Age 2 were scrapped, which would have had the player in a globe-trotting adventure. And in its place came a much smaller scale game, one set in a single city, Kirkwall, the City of Chains, with a singular focus on a single family. And then came a year-long crunch. Long, stressful, unhealthy hours of work to overhaul Dragon Age's combat, art design, dialogue system, and skill trees, on top of designing an entirely new story, set of characters, and social system. David Silverman, the marketing director for Bioware during Dragon Age 2's development, summarized the gameplay thusly. And that's when you press a button, something awesome has to happen. So button awesome. It was all changed due to Dragon Age Origins. According to Bioware's own metrics, a large percentage of players dropped Origins after only an hour of play. They decided a large contributing factor for this was that the combat lacked immediacy. This awesome button approach countered that. And for the most part, this combat change works. Combat is faster. Spells are bigger. Melee characters charge forward. Enemies come in waves, keeping the battle dynamic, requiring fewer pauses and not worrying about ally placement, which would slow down engagement time. But the sheer number of encounters and how they would spawn in bogged the combat down. Most enemies do not exist in the game world until combat starts. They would pop out of the ground, be summoned in, or simply jump down out of the sky. Then, as the fight progressed, more would spawn in, usually in a radial around the combat area. This meant that weaker backline classes, like archers and mages, would often get enemies dropped right on their heads, requiring the player to use some of their threat management skills to keep their squishies alive. And no other mechanic in the game feels more awkward than the threat management system. Threat is a unit of measurement for enemy aggression. Characters can grow or diminish their threat with abilities and gear, and the enemy AI will pick the biggest perceived threat to attack. In Origins, the most effective way to gain threat was to put on heavy or massive armor types. However, there is no way to put armor on companions in Dragon Age 2, so now it all comes down to character abilities. Every class has threat management options. Warriors have the ability to generate threat, while mages and rogues have abilities to drop or redirect threat. Threat growth is also attached to damage, so high damaging classes like mages will grow more threat than a sword and shield warrior, who do really poor damage and require skills such as taunt to hold aggro. The unforeseen consequence of enemies spawning in waves from all directions is that it nearly negates all threat management. Backline troops would often be too far away from a warrior's threat pulling ability to have any effect. All these mechanics combined into a perfect storm, where we have a complicated and well thought out threat management system that is nearly useless on every level of difficulty other than Nightmare. And on Nightmare, it's situational at best. 
The best way to handle the mobs in this game is just to dish out damage faster than the enemy can. Another big change to the series was the inclusion of a voiced protagonist, like Bioware's other popular series, Mass Effect. At least we're alive. That's no small feat. With a voice protagonist came a system unique among Bioware games, the personality system. Your hawk could be diplomatic, sarcastic, or aggressive. Here, I got you something. Why? Don't give me that look. Be grateful for five minutes. This is decided by which personality dialogue options you chose the most. Pick diplomatic dialogue 60% of the time, and your hawk has a diplomatic disposition. There are three acts in Dragon Age 2, and the personality system partially resets at the start of each act, allowing the player to grow and change their personality as the story continues. The dialogue wheel is a simple UI element that allows the player to read a paraphrased dialogue option while also seeing which tone the dialogue came with thanks to these handy icons. Let's say there are three options available to you. One is diplomatic, another sarcastic, and the last one is blunt. While you see three options, there can be as many as nine lines of dialogue available, as each choice can have up to three variations depending on your personality. This makes Dragon Age 2's dialogue options incredibly varied. Playing the game twice allows you to hear very different dialogue depending on your roleplay. Lead writer David Gator called this system card tricks in the dark, meaning it was cool, but the players were not aware of the system. At the best of times, the system supported robust roleplay, as Hawk's personality would change organically through each act. At worst, some players complained that their Hawk would say extremely different things than the option presented. What did you do to scare this man to death? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with demons. It was also an expensive system, both monetarily by having actors say more lines of dialogue, and animating alternate scenes that the player would be unaware of unless they replayed the entire game, which most players rarely did. But from a role-playing perspective, this system honored player choice and led to great variety in replays. It's one of my favorite features, and is why I still replay this game nearly 10 years since its release. The aesthetics of the game are a sore spot to some. In many respects, it's a downgrade. Lighting and shadows are much worse. Enemies explode into chunky gore, and everything is generally bigger, more abstract, and impressionistic. The new aesthetic also gave them a chance to redesign all the races in the game. In the first game, humans, elves, dwarves, and quinari all shared the same body, just scaled up or down depending on the race. This meant the body proportions were a bit jank by the time it was shrunk down to the dwarf size. By redesigning all the races, they were able to keep bodies proportional for each race. Some redesigns are outstanding, and just so much better, like the Quinari redesign which got a lot of praise. Other designs were subtle enough to not be noticed, like the humans and dwarves. But then there's the elves. Elves are still shorter than humans, and taller than dwarves. But now they're skinnier. Their eyes are larger and further apart, their ears no longer point up, but rather droop a bit, like goat's ears. And their noses are sloped sharply from the bridge through the dorsum, almost like a Bajoran from Star Trek. Many dislike the new elf look, but I preferred this look over the other designs. They look inhuman. The big eyes and the more noticeable ears really set them apart. But I'm in the minority, and Bioware redesigned the elves again for the next Dragon Age game anyway. To me, the worst redesign ever was what they did to the Darkspawn. Darkspawn are a tainted collective made up of corrupted versions of the main four races of Thetis. I understand that Darkspawn were generic orcs and goblins in the first game, but I'd rather take generic over this messy design. Lastly, with aesthetic changes, each companion now has a unique look, stance, posture, and outfit to set them apart. But with these now iconic looks came the removal of letting the player put armor on the companions. Talents, skills, and attributes went through a complete redesign. Talents and spells are activated, sustainable, and passive abilities which focus primarily on combat. Prior ability trees were a linear progression, grab this and then grab the next one. Here there's a slight bit of choice as each tree offers at least two paths. It's a small change, but I appreciate it. Plus, it looks visually appealing, with passives as circles, activated abilities as diamonds, and sustainable abilities as hexagons. 
Attributes are back, but they're just different enough to mess with returning players. For example, in Origins, cunning was used to determine armor piercing, and was important to dagger-wielding rogues. In Dragon Age 2, cunning inexplicably raises a character's defense, regardless of class, and for rogues, it allows them to lockpick. Skills were similar to talents and spells in that you chose them on level-ups, but skills had a focus on non-combat elements to character expression, such as, was your character a thief? Or were they skilled at crafting? Did they have a way with words? Dragon Age 2 dropped these skills entirely. Dialogue skills are now mixed in with the personality system. The lockpicking skill is now a check against a rogue's cunning. Crafting is removed and replaced with a shop which requires gold and the player finding resource nodes. Stealing and survival skills were just plain removed from the game altogether, and combat training benefits are now added automatically as your character levels. I have no problem with streamlining games to make them more accessible to those who might not like spending a lot of time in menus, but I do miss having skills. Non-combat specific skills allow the player to interact with the world or express their character's roleplay without violence, and whenever any game removes these non-combat skills or abilities, it limits our ability to interact with the world. While I'm talking about abilities, I might as well talk about the tactics menu. Here you can program how each character behaves. You need a trigger and an action. So a simple one is to have a trigger set as self any, and make the action be activate ability rock armor. Now that character will always make sure to have rock armor on. But it is possible to program more complex behaviors with this system. Like here I have Anders as my healing mage. I want him to contribute to damage output like any other character, but I also don't want him to use the last of his mana on an attack. So with the trigger, self, mana, or stamina less than 50%, and the action being jump to trigger 14, I have set up a mana check. The computer always checks the triggers in numerical order. So number one, I have him heal himself if he's hurt. He's my dedicated healer, and I don't want him dying. But after that, I have the computer check his mana before checking number 3, which is casting Spirit Bolt at disoriented targets. But it will only check for number 3 if his mana is higher than 50%, because if it's less, the computer jumps to number 14. And once it reaches the end of the triggers at 19, it loops back up to number 1. And if number 2 is still true, it'll jump to number 14 again. In this way, Anders never really runs out of mana, and can mostly take care of himself in large battles. I believe that everyone has a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle that they aspire to be, and I have always aspired to be Leonardo, and the Tactics menu allows me to be Leonardo. The inclusion of cross-class combos also really shines here. Cross-class combos are two abilities from different classes that work together to deal incredible damage. There are three statuses that can set up cross-class combos, Staggered, Disoriented, and Brittle. Each status has its own symbol, which will display over the affected enemy's heads during combat. For example, the mage spell Winter's Blast causes the Brittle status. Then a warrior can use their talent, Mighty Blow, as a detonator for tremendous damage. Potion management is different now, limiting the amount of health, mana, and stamina potions the player can have, as well as adding a cooldown on use, restricting the player from drinking multiple potions in a row. There are also fewer healing spells in the game. For the most part, players will only have heal and the Anders-specific spell aid allies. And the cooldowns on the spells and potions are hefty. I find this system vastly preferable to Dragon Age Origins. No longer do you have a half dozen healing spells and upward of a hundred potions for encounters. It encourages a more thoughtful approach to combat, while also encouraging different options. A rogue's stealth and obscuring talents keep enemies from damaging a character. Threat management talents redirect enemies. And spells like Barrier can be cast on weakened companions, giving them plus 100% damage resistance to outlast a tough opponent. Finally, we must talk about the elephant in the room. Dragon Age 2 is notorious for its constant reusing of maps. As the story takes place inside one city over the course of eight years, some reuse was to be expected. But Kirkwall doesn't change much over those eight years. We run over the same 37 areas over and over again, with many of these maps standing in for multiple locations. This repetition makes the game visually dull, and the flat lighting and uninspired map design wears on me after a while. 
running over the same cave map or coast map for the dozenth time, all the while knowing I'll run over it a half dozen times more before the credits roll, demoralizes me. Plus, Kirkwall is ugly. It's brown and sand-colored. A lot of the buildings are giant boxes. Much of its textures look dull and lifeless. Crowds of people are few and far between, and those that do exist are low-resolution dummies positioned all over the map. I understand the crunch was harsh and that their timetable was tight, but I really wish they'd outsource their map making either to a different Bioware team or outside of the company. They didn't even need to be great combat maps, as the game shipped with quite a few unspectacular combat arenas, such as this room with the Aeroshock. Friendship and Rivalry Like most Bioware games, companions will react to the player's choices. Certain actions earn the player friendship or rivalry points. Friendship points usually mean you were kind, agreed with the party member, or were enabling towards them. I didn't realize you were in the market for a slave. I gave her a job, Fenris. Ah, then that's good. My apologies. Let's find Hadriana and be done with this place. Rivalry points were usually awarded for being critical, mean, or disagreeing with a party member. The demon was in my head. Nothing but the shit made sense. Everything you say proves your weakness. Well, we can't all be perfect like you. That would make the world too boring, wouldn't it? I already said I was sorry. What more do you want? Would you like me to clean your privy for a month? Shit. You really shouldn't have said that. Having a high friendship or rivalry with a character is the goal. Both are valid paths that ensure that the character stays loyal to the player and deepens the relationship. No, I won't fight to save these mages. Not for you, not for anyone. Romances in the game also come in these two distinct flavors, and the friendship and rival romances are quite different. This is the rule I will most cherish breaking. With this system, the player isn't punished for disagreeing with party characters. Instead, the player is punished for not having strong positions with the characters. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree, only that you understand one another. It's a massive improvement over the first game's binary approval-disapproval system, which usually meant just leaving some characters behind for certain events, and if you got on a character's bad side, you just gave them gifts until they liked you again. Here, even if you disagree with a strongly opinionated character such as Fenris, it benefited you to bring them along and interact with them, even if all you did was argue with one another. Mostly I like this system. It's a tad messy and in need of polishing like many of the game's features, but I'm a huge fan of choices having exclusive consequences. Playing a pro Templar Hawk while keeping Anders around as a healer gets you so much rivalry specific content. For Anders specifically, a rival relationship makes him so much more sympathetic. Trash. Trash. Won't be needing that anymore. Throwing everything out isn't going to make you feel better. Should I feel better? You were the only thing that kept me from murdering an innocent girl. It's all gone wrong. Justice and I, we're just a monster. Same as any abomination. Which, again, really adds value to replays as you learn about all these aspects to the characters. And with that, let's talk about one of the absolute strengths of this game. The setting. Once, long ago, the elves supposedly ruled all of Thetis. Their kingdom was called Arlathon, and it was governed by the elven pantheon known as the Creators. Magic was commonplace, and spirits and demons lived amongst the immortal elves. These days, spirits and demons exist solely in the Fade, a spirit realm accessed by mages and all those who dream. Magic is said to have come from the Fade, and no living person can enter the Fade while awake because of a barrier separating the two realms called the Veil. Then the dwarves came along and dug these massive tunnels connecting dozens of large underground cities called Tigs. 
Supposedly, the dwarven tunnels, called the Deep Roads, span the entire world. Then, for no good reason, as far as we know, humans came along. And when they did, the elves lost their immortality. The humans and elves were said to have fought. The humans won. Or at least, they claimed victory. The human nation, Tevinter, supposedly sunk Arlathon into the ground with terrible magics. The truths of these events are only somewhat known, but this is the general understanding of the world's history, as known by the people who reside in it. The Tevinter Imperium then took over the world. They built roads everywhere they conquered, creating the Imperial Highway, which is still in use some 2,000 years later. The Imperium made an alliance with the Dwarves, and mostly killed and enslaved the Elven race. The Imperium was ruled by fearsome mages who practiced blood magic. Blood magic allows mages to control the minds of others, as well as use blood to fuel awesome spells. The Magisters of Tevinter believe in a dragon pantheon known as the Old Gods. These Old Gods taught the Magisters of the Golden City, a place of extreme power where perhaps even the Maker himself resides. It exists in the Fade, far away from mortal man. Seven Magisters, collectively known as the Magisters Sidriel, broke through the Veil using blood magic supposedly taught by their old gods. But the Magisters Sidriel had brought sin with them, and the city turned black in their presence. The Magisters came back to Thetis twisted and corrupted. They were the first Darkspawn, and when they touched the old god Dumat, it turned into a terrible archdemon and the world very nearly ended in an event known as the Blight. The arrival of a mysterious order of warriors known as the Grey Wardens ended the Blight. No one outside of their secretive order knows how they accomplished this feat. Eventually, human barbarian tribes in the south rallied together and began to overthrow the weakened Imperium. They were led by Andraste and her husband, Mafarath. Andraste was said to have been the Bride of the Maker, a single creator god who sung the world into being. She and her followers waged a very successful rebellion, until she was betrayed by her own husband and given over to the Archon Hesarian of the Tevinter Imperium. She was burned at the stake, but like Obi-Wan Kenobi, she only grew more powerful in death as her followers formed a church around her called the Chantry, and those followers of the Chantry call themselves Andrastians. The Chantry teaches that the Maker turned his back on Thetis after the Magister Sidriel invaded his throne in the Golden City, and the only way to have him come back is to spread the Chant of Light across the world. As Andraste fought the evil ancient Magisters, it was decreed that magic should serve man and not rule him. And so the Chantry created the Circle of Magi and the Templar Order. Mages are gathered by the Templar and placed in circle towers to keep them far away from normal people. Mages cannot hold titles or land, and they are essentially prisoners in these towers. Mages are supposed to have equal say in the rule of the circles, but the Templars truly exert more power. They serve as police and jailers to the mages, and you don't have to look hard to see the systemic abuses suffered in the Circle. Kirkwall is one of three major city-states in the Free Marches. Kirkwall is known as the City of Chains. It was founded by the Tevinter Imperium and housed thousands of slaves. Some of these slaves worked to death in the mines, while others were shipped all over the Imperium. The Gallows, a small island in Kirkwall's bay, held these slaves. Now the Gallows serve as Kirkwall's circle of magi. Suffering and death is supposed to weaken the veil to the Fade. How much suffering has the Gallows seen over these 2,000 years? And one last thing, the enigma of Kirkwall. The veil is very thin here, so thin that demons are said to be able to pass freely into the waking world. And the architecture is wrong. The city's streets are a maze. And if you find a map of the city, it almost looks as though the streets and alleyways form some kind of magical sigil. Did the ancient magisters weaken the veil here on purpose? If so, why? Did they contact something here? Bring something over? Or is this where the magister Sidriel crossed over into the Golden City? 
where the first darkspawn were made, where the Maker turned his back on creation. One thing is for sure, Kirkwall is a place of madness and suffering. And there's no place like home. Next time on Dragon Age 2, we explore the story. Whatever the hell this is. The characters. All of the story DLC. All this and more next week on Dragon Age 2.